Hi there. Welcome to Flip the Script Season 2, Episode 23, Coaching. What on earth to coach on, how to improve reps, and how to do all of that in a newly remote environment. My name is Beck Holland. I'm the CEO and founder of Flip the Script. Before we dive in, if you do me a favor, go to flipthescript.co and make sure you download the deck so we can follow along at each step of the way together. Once you've done that, go ahead and jump in. So let us start with a bit of an agenda. As far as an agenda today, we're going to break it up into nine different pieces. Let's get nerdy, y'all. Number one, tips on coaching reps how to improve. Numbers two through four, we're going to uh, outline what to coach on for an SDR in their first 90 days, 90 to 180 days, and 180 and beyond. We're then going to do the same for account executives. Number five, six, and seven, we're going to do account executives, first 90 days, 90 to 180, and 180 and beyond for an AE. Number A, how to coach an individual remotely. And then we're going to finish off with how to coach a group remotely because they can be different. So let's start with number one, how to t- uh, tips on coaching reps to improve. So this is just going to be a couple of general tips on coaching in general uh, that I have added in that have really made the difference between making my coaching sessions good and making my coaching sessions really have some impact. Uh, Number one, I would dig for data on coaching. So the first thing that you need to know is finitely what someone is doing and where they are struggling. So before you know what struggling, uh, what uh, why they're struggling or where they're struggling, you need to know the data of what they're doing. So I would dig for data points. I put a couple of different ones up here, but data on their activity, the quality of their messaging, the persona that they're calling into, et cetera. There's really seven different pieces that can ca- cause conversion. So are they, and I go into this uh, much more heavily in the accountability, how to hold reps accountable, uh, uh, Driving accountability, sorry for the grammar scrub. Driving accountability for reps in a remote environment. I think it's uh, episode 20 within season two. So I go into an exhaustive list there of all the seven different pieces that cause conversion. But I put a couple of examples here that you can grab the activity uh, or the data points for activity, quality of messaging, and persona. So you get the gist for more go into that session. Number two, you want to know the two different sides of coaching. There are two different sides to coaching. There is fire and brimstone, and there is the enablement portion. So I've said this quote probably multiple times during the season, but to get someone moving, I'm from Texas, and my mom used to say whenever I was growing up and she was braiding my hair and yanking my my hair over to the side, that you need two things to get someone moving. The promise of the keys to the kingdom, if they do really well, and the threat of the fiery gates of hell behind them to get them moving. So we want to ensure that we are doing both with reps, Part of this is going to be we need to enable them, you know, to get them moving in the right direction, enable them through coaching, training, etc. But we also need to have a little bit of fire and brimstone, uh, brimstone, so to speak, of the accountability of once they give them the coaching. If it's not an acumen issue and it's not a uh, they aren't ascertaining it or education issue, if it is an accountability issue and they aren't deploying that methodology, what do we do in that case scenario? So I would say you need to view from a mindset perspective, coaching and both of those facets to know like there's going to be some things that they just haven't learned. Uh, so I need to coach them and enable them through that. And some pieces that they just aren't doing even when I have coached them and they know better. So I need to have both of those of kind of like an iron fist and a velvet glove to really get the perfect balance. So our bodies crave balance and from a leadership perspective and from being led, we crave balance as well. So we don't want to be led by the leader who is always enabling uh, because then we think we feel like we can walk all over them and we don't have to actually be held accountable for our actions, but we also don't want to be, uh, be led by the person who is always doing the fire and brimstone. And so we don't feel like they're really on our side. So whenever people are studying addiction to certain types of foods, I want you to think Nutella, peanut butter, these scientists are constantly studying for the perfect state of balance between sweet and salty. So we want to make sure that our coaching per, uh, coaching flavors has both sweet and salty along the way to get our reps moving. Um, number three, how to empower. Just a quick, some quick tips here. I would empower by the way of data, not stories. 
So a lot of times the best leaders for me is when I gave them some kind of narrative. Yeah, well, I feel like, you know, this happened and this happened and this happened. They said, well, you know, that's a great narrative, but 67% of the time you're not doing this thing. So it really helped bump up my accountability and hold me to a standard that I wasn't held to before. So I would always empower by the way of data and giving them that as a backdrop. Number two, I would identify for them as a coach what you think is happening in the situation. So there could be a myriad of reasons of why people aren't performing. You know, again, go into that accountability session, but it could be they're not calling enough. It could be they're not emailing enough. It could be they're not calling the right person. It could be they're not calling the right account. It could be they're not calling at the right time of day. It could be that they're calling only and not sending messages omnichannel over LinkedIn and uh, email to really set the stage could be what they're saying on the phone and the quality of their messaging, et cetera. And so you want to prep for your rep of like, I'm going to dig for the data points on all the things that you're doing here from an account perspective, the people you're calling into buyer personas, messaging and volume. And then I'm going to drill it down to what are the top guesses that I have uh, of why, why you're not performing or if you are performing, how you can perform even better. So you need to do the legwork for them of identifying the three things or the two things that they need to improve, knowing that everyone always has room to improve, but you don't want to overcook uh, the goose, so to speak, or boil the ocean. So you want to make sure that if they are, if the program, let's say at a best case scenario is a 10, typically whenever you go into a program, they're either going to be a two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. You don't know which one. So you want to dig the data of where they're at and why. And then know that from your perspective, your job isn't to get them from a two to a 10 overnight. That's impossible. You will actually usually churn the person because they feel like they can't do it. You just need to get them to go from a two to a three. So the first part is identifying where they're at and why that they're at a two. And now it's about putting a plan in action. How do I get them to a three in a very digestible way? Uh, Number three, I would find a way to discover what works. This is a big one. It is our responsibility as leaders to uncover what works on cold calls, what works in terms of our buyer persona, what works in terms of the amount of people that we, they should call it an account, the amount of people, um, you know, should they multi-thread, how should they do it, et cetera, and then infuse that into our rep. So I see countless leaders and way too many leaders who have the good intent, but they don't know how to handle that objection or they don't know, you know, how to write that cold email, you know, for a rep, or they don't know how to respond to that objection or that person who's running into a meeting and they tell you that, they don't know how to respond to cause conversion. And so they start leaving it up to the reps and then they start punishing the reps whenever they're not hitting quota. So I think the best thing that you can do to empower your reps is understand the data, identify what you think is happening and what's going wrong and where they can improve. Also what they're doing well for encouragement. And then if you, if you think that the problem is that they are not emailing effectively, instead of just saying email more effectively, you need to help them understand how to email more effectively. If you don't know how to do that, I would go to any source. I would be, uh, Lord knows I would never plug flip, flip the script, um, but you need to find some kind of source that will help you uh, learn how to email effectively, if nothing else for your know-how so that you can coach your reps. Train a rep how to do it correctly. Once you do uncover what works, you need to hold yourself accountable as a leader that if this thing doesn't work, if I give them a suggestion and they deploy it and it doesn't work, I'm accountable to that result. So I need to find a way to go find something that does work. Be relentless, relentless about finding something that works so that you can teach it to your reps. And number five, hold the rep accountable to deployment. So I I think I've mentioned this in several different sessions. I would argue uh, there are several different weaknesses to me as a leader. Um, If I had to guess why reps stayed with me, even though I was known as the snow queen, that I'm constantly pushing innovation, I'm constantly pushing them to get better. I am, uh, I'm tough. I'm really, really tough to work for. If I had to guess why people didn't churn on me, it was because I was relentless about finding things that really worked for them on the phone, deploying it, knowing that there was a potential that it didn't work. And when it did work, it would catch them on fire. So a good way to get people moving during COVID is to give them a game plan that actually works to get them results during COVID. 
Um, sorry, I got really pumped up. Point number four, consistency uh, for coaching reps. You need to be sure to be consistent. So the best coaches that I have uh, ever seen are very, very um, consistent in terms of the amount of sessions that they're having and when they're having those sessions. So I would be sure to plan a session, say, okay, every Thursday at two, we are having this coaching session and I would be sure not to skip it. Mark McWaters, he's a VP of sales over at Ambition. He's an amazing VP of sales. Shout out Mark if he is watching this. I have seen him empower his teams, enable his teams, and really be after their own good. And this is one thing that he does insatiably well, is he picks a time Thursday at one, and he identified the problem as a la carte to Ambition's value prop uh, in, in part of that people were VPs of sales or sales leaders were coming by and being like doing the drive by one on one. Are you good? Oh, are, do you need to be coached on anything? If you don't, okay, let's just pull it. Cause it's easier to just pull it, but it's easy, easy things, hard life, hard things, easy life, right? So we want to make sure that we are coaching our reps and putting in the time to do that because then the outcome is there. So it makes it a much easier life on the back end. So you want to pull a Mark McWaters and you want to be sure to plan a regular cadence of coaching sessions and you need to hold to that cadence. So if you think it's too aggressive, I've gotten there where I'm like, I want to do an hour. And then I'm like, holy cow, this is a lot of hours of coaching. Then I would scale it back, but I would still keep it on the calendar and be sure to do what you say you're going to do. Uh, number five, aggregate coaching. This is a gold mine. <laughs> gold mine. I switched to this it took me way too long to switch to aggregate coaching and I'll tell you what it is in a minute. But once I did, it made a huge impact for my reps. So typically what I had done in the past, but I is I would tell my reps, Hey, bring me one email or bring me one cold call per week, you know, that you want to review in our coaching session. So sometimes they'd pick great cold calls that they just wanted to get some encouragement. Sometimes they'd pick really bad cold calls where they're like, I really want the coaching. Um, but point being, they would only bring me one and that was at my request. So I would help them with that call. And I'd say, I would stop the call in chorus and say like, okay, this is where you could encounter better. This is where you could have pushed the needle in terms of buyer persona. You didn't listen to the person there. This is where you went on a self-righteous monologue. And I would give them the, uh, tips for that, that cold call in specific. But something that was always striking to me was, well, now they know how to do that cold call better. But that cold call's already passed. So what about future cold calls? And also, what about aggregate cold calls? What are things that they're doing that they need to work on, uh, work on in aggregate? So I'll sum it up by saying this. Eating a sleeve of Oreos one day a year is not that damaging. Eating a sleeve of Oreos every single day for a calendar year is pretty damaging. So you need to understand what are the low-hanging fruit and what are the things in terms of severity that are affecting their day to day? And to know what's really severe for them, you need to know the frequency that something is happening. So a lot of times, instead of just when I switched from, it was a life changer for me. And I honestly did this much too late in my career. I had been doing the one-on-one -on -one coaching where people were bringing me an email or, or a call or maybe a couple little ad hoc calls and chorus, et cetera for all the way up in my career until uh, post the tour in March of this year. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to start doing aggregate. I want to see what they're doing in general so that I can make some more impact because COVID hit and I knew and in my mindset, I'm like, I have to find a way to get them numbers during a pandemic. So I went like full back mode and I'm like, how can I make the most impact? And when I really started thinking in that mindset, it was interesting the stuff that I was coming up, coming up with. I'm like, why didn't I do this stuff from the beginning? I started scanning through my CRM and I said, you don't have to bring me a cold call, you know, once per week, you can bring me an ad hoc item if you want help on a response email, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to dive through your emails every single day. And instead of just reading, you know, one email, I'd go, okay, I'm going to scan through these top 10 emails and be like, whoa, okay, these are way too long in general, or the subject line is off in general, or the formatting in general, typically for this rep is off. So they would come to this one-on-one -on -one, and for the first five minutes, I would just start scanning through their emails and be like, let me show you what I'm seeing. I'd share my screen and I would pull up the last 30 emails that they did of the day and be like, oh, okay, in general, you're not hooking. You're coming up with a personalization piece 
and then you are a la carte being relevant, but you're not really hooking them together. So that is your problem with this email. So when I transitioned from people bringing me a la carte messages of like, hey, I'm gonna bring you this one email into I'm gonna review all of these different emails that you've been doing in aggregate over the last 24 hours, it was a game changer for me because it turned me into from, hey, there's advice on this cold call that has already passed to here are the biggest impact items. So overnight, each rep is going to struggle in different facets and in different places. And sometimes it's accountability issue. They don't want to personalize or they don't want to be relevant. And so this is a great way to understand, you know, the biggest impact that you can have is in terms of how egregiously, you know, bad are they doing something? And then how often are they doing something both? And so if you can find those items and then work your way backwards, back of the bar napkin math, it will make the most impact in your team. So my uh, team, I was so proud of them during COVID, you know, COVID hit and I'm like, holy cow, I'm going to have to lead this team through a pandemic. What are the things that I can affect and how? And I'm like, I want to go into quality of messaging. So I went into quality of messaging and aggregate, and it was a game changer for us. So April of, which was right the month after COVID hit, we had the best month as an org we had ever had. May, the same thing. June, we topped May. July, we topped June. And then I sort of flipped the script. So it's like they were just doing really well and I was so proud of them. And if I had to guess why, one of the main indicators was because I started going from one-on-one -on -one coaching to the things that they were doing in aggregate. So it helped make them a big impact. So it's like, if you can tell them one thing that they are doing every single time that they swing, that impact just resonate and amplifies. Number six, uh, specific and limited takeaways. This is something in these sessions that I am terrible at. <laughs> I give everyone a lot of data and things to do. It's after a full comprehensive book, and I'm glad that people have it on replay. But when you're talking to a rep, know that if they are the average person, that they have 15% retention. So if you've ever done any kind of acting or you've ever done any kind of, you know, anything, sports, etc., it's almost impossible to change multiple things at once. It's much easier, it's hard to change anything at all, but it's much harder to change multiple things at once. So you wanna be sure that instead of saying like, hey, I'm looking at this email and it's too long, they didn't personalize, they weren't relevant, they didn't hook them together, you know, they weren't fluid, uh, the subject line was bad. Uh, you know, they were pretty arrogant in the email. They didn't listen to the, et cetera, et cetera. If I have these top nine things, I'm evaluating them against which ones are happening the most often and which ones are happening the most egregiously. And then I'm picking my top two out of those lists. And I'm saying, okay, I am uh, what they call a poop sandwich. Uh, they use another word, but I can't because I'm on camera. <laughs> uh, the poop sandwich is you're going to tell them something they did well, tell them something to work on, and tell them something they did well in the end. I know that it sounds planned, but it actually, when you're receiving it, it sounds great because you don't want to just be, you don't want to come to someone and just hear about all the things you do incorrectly, even though it's great in our heads. It makes you feel like that person doesn't think you're valuable or that you're not doing good at your job. So you want to have the details of like poop sandwich, you know, the bread is great. You did this really well. You were really, really brief. You, you know, you have summed that up for, uh, since last week. We need to work a little bit on your hooking. You're hooking, um, you know, you're, you're struggling a little bit to hook personalization to relevance, uh, but also, you know, your whatever, the buyer persona pit, the buyer persona that you picked, it was a spot on in terms of value prop. So let's just focus on this hooking portion, but good job on these other two. So you want to pick out two takeaways per one on one that you're coaching to the rep very, very distinctly. These are the two takeaways, and you want to make sure that they are documentable and that you write them down so that someone can, again, re return to those uh, coaching takeaways so they can make sure that they deploy them. And then the last point here is you want to hold your reps accountable to deployment of coaching. Not in a mean way, not in an arrogant way, not in a self-serving way, but in a way of if I'm coaching someone on something, it is typically these are the most egregious and frequent items, and I have a litany of other things that they can do better. I have a litany of things that I can do better in all of my messages. So I am, just so you know, 
someone who I am working with constantly. I know that we just announced the partnership for Reggie, where I am going to be pairing with the Reggie and Sapper consulting team to be ironing and flip the script sequences to go to the market. Their uh, leader, Matt Millen, is coaching me on brevity. <laughs> So before you think that I have the temerity to think that I don't need coaching, everyone needs coaching. And he said, hey, you know, would this be of some help to you? And I jumped all over it, hurt my ego a little bit, but I'm like, that is what moving on and accountability and progression is all about. So something I struggle with, especially in these, these uh, high level vision videos of what the flip, script, uh, flip the script is, is brevity. And so he's coaching me on it. So in terms of accountability, you want to make sure if I coach my rep on two items and just two takeaways, you want to make sure that they are deploying those items. Number one, if they uh, don't have the acumen and they don't understand it, that you need to reinforce so they can master the item. Or number two, if they just aren't doing it, they just aren't adhering to your coaching. If someone isn't adhering to me telling them uh, you need to trim this food from your diet and I come back to the one-on-one -on -one and they're still eating that food, I'm like, well, okay, why would I move on? Why would I move on? And what reason do I have to think that whenever I correct your running stride or the volume that you're running, that you would actually listen to me? So you want to stick back there and hold some accountability to your rep in terms of deployment, not with the narrative, but with the data point that they uh, weren't doing it. And so you ask the background as to why. So those are just some tips. Let's talk about what to coach on for an SDR in their first 90 days. Uh, in their first 90 days, I am going to break this down into, um, this looks like a long slide, but we're actually going to be pretty short. There are four different types of things that I am coaching SDRs on in their first 90 days. There are three different types of learning uh, when it comes to um, any kind of organization. There is onboarding, there is training, and there is coaching. They're used synonymously. They're very, very different. Onboarding is the initial nascent stage journey for people who are joining your organization so they get to know you. Training is teaching someone how to do something. And coaching is identifying where they're struggling against that training and, and uh, reinforcing some kind of uh, level of where they could improve to get better at that training and that deployment. So great example, onboarding would be come get to know flip the script, you know, Training would be, this is how you have an effective cold call. And coaching would be, for this person in specific, where are they struggling within that, uh, that cold call structure so I can train them to, or I can coach them to get better. So three very, very different concepts, used synonymously, but they're very different. So the four things that you can uh, coach on in the first 90 days, role-specific, company-specific, messaging-specific, and expectation-specific. So I limited to the things that you can truly coach on of, things that you can train on, and then you can reinforce uh, so that they can get better at this item, not just a one-time learn. So for role-specific, I put terms and definitions, what an SDR does, working with an account executive and inbound versus outbound. This should be a very for, uh, short coaching. If they don't get this you know, right off the bat, it's usually not an ongoing thing that they learn more and more and more um, of terms and definitions or what an inbound and outbound rep does. Usually this is a one-stop shop but I put it up there just in case. Number two, company specific. What does our company do? What are our value props? What are our competitive props? And integration partners. These are ever growing, especially when we feature release. So competitive differentiators today, typically for especially a company in tech, is not gonna be your competitive differentiators tomorrow. Maybe the other competitive platform releases these features. That's how this thing rolls. Or maybe you release new features. So you want to coach, release those through a product marketing engine, you know, track it and put it in seismic so that your reps can get to know it. And then make sure as you are going each step of the way and as these evolve and adapt and change that you change with them. Uh, number three, messaging specific in the first 90 days. So this is buyer persona pitch, cold email, cold call, objection handling, social selling. This is very high level, meaning you are teaching, especially if you're coaching an SDR, how to have a cold call in general. Now, there's 80,000 different pieces that can cause conversion in a cold call. Tone, you know, whether you're personalizing, whether you're relevant, we'll get into some of them. But in the first 90 days, you just want to focus on, I'm teaching them how to have the cold call structure 
And are they able to ascertain that? And if not, where are they struggling? So I can help uh, reinforce that. And then the fourth piece is expectation setting. So qualification on ICC, which is ideal customer company. So you're coaching them on, hey, you just booked this meeting, you know, day 67, you just booked this meeting with this company. They actually only have 90 people. We sell into people with 100 uh, employees plus. So not a problem. We'll take this one. But I want to coach you on how to identify accounts that do hit our ICC in terms of employee headcount. Uh, qualifying on ICT, that's title. So, hey, you just booked this meeting with a manager. No problem. We actually only sell into director level or and above. Or, hey, you just set this meeting. This is very common. Within sales operations, we actually sell to operations proper, not sales operations in specific. So let's talk about the difference between those two. Uh, three, activity expectations. This is an ongoing coaching thing and a reinforcement and accountability thing. This is our metric. We want to make sure that we're hitting it. And uh, what are the bottlenecks from holding us back from that? Number four, prospect loading. How do I load prospects into my tech? And number five, the number of people that you are hunting at each account. So this, uh, there's a lot of different theories on this and a lot of different schools of thought. So I would just make sure that I pick one and that I coach my SDRs to, uh, I train them, number one, of how many people that is the expectation. And then I reinforce that narrative through coaching. So that's the first 90 days for SDRs. Let's talk about the uh, second 90 days. Sorry, I had to do quick math and add. What's the difference between 180 and 90? Second 90 days, days 90 through 180. So we're basically going to go a level deeper. So what to coach on for the second 90 days, I'm gonna go in messaging in specific. So my rep has just learned uh, addition and subtraction. I'm now going to go on to um, once they've mastered that, I'm going to go on to multiplication and division. No, addition and subtraction. And now I'm going on to multiplication and division. So multiplication and division, a uh, division, let's start with messaging. So this is the most common, uh, theme that you're going to revisit whenever you're coaching reps, because this is one of the things that you can really control or one of the things that predicates success. Uh, but the coaching items, I listed out a number one uh, of ones that I focus on in the second 90 days with an SDR, but follow-up emails, breakup emails, relevance, picking the best bucket premise. There's five different buckets of personalized premises. For more on that, if you go to the personalization at scale session over in the core sessions, I talk more about what those buckets are, but the, I rank them in terms of which ones cause the most trigger, uh, the most responses. And oftentimes buckets four and five are easier. So I'd see my reps there. So I want to coach them in the second 90 days to get into buckets one, two, and three, not because I have an opinion or a preference or want to play queen of the universe, but that's where they will see more conversion. So I want to push them to do something a little bit harder that will give them more of a payoff. Uh, number five, competitive positioning. You can go a level deeper here. So there is always the high level stuff, but how can we get, you know, a little more ingrained in the product so you, you can back those things up. Uh, number six, granular multi-level uh, buyer persona, uh, buyer persona. So there's always several different things that a buyer persona, um, you know, runs into during their day. Any kind of buyer persona, if you're in business, then you run into a multitude of different pains, different things that you're uh, running into during your day or pleasure that you want to see added. So I would take it a level deeper and say like, hey, we talked about sales enablement and the difference between sales enablement and sales leaders and days zero through 90. Let's take that a step deeper to talk about the things that they're KPI'd on, metriced on, and makes it the difference between a good and great sales enablement leader versus a sales leader. Uh, seven, the root of objections. There are two different kinds of objections, shallow ones and real ones. Uh, if you counter a real one, you're going to make people mad. <laughs> so I would help in the second 90 days. For more on that, if you go to, I believe it's session uh, four within episode, or I'm sorry, episode four within season two. Uh, but I talk about the difference between the two. But you can, there is a way to root out what kind of objection, which bucket that falls into, which ones should I counter, how do I counter those, et cetera. But I would help them understand the more, the granularity of when someone says, send me an email. Yeah, I'll totally read it. What do they really mean by that? And how can I counter it in a way that makes them want to take a conversation? Uh, number eight, brevity. Number nine, voicemail. See how I did that? 
See, Matt, I'm getting better. <laughs> Number nine, voicemails, and number 10, subject line. So really from a messaging perspective where we started with cold email and cold call and objection handling, now we're going a level deeper. And okay, within emails, follow-up emails, breakup emails, et cetera, like how can we take this a step further? And then uh, the rest of the things that you can coach in the first, uh, or I'm sorry, the second 90 days, days 90 through 180 is account specific, uh, how to effectively uh, hunt accounts from the top down, how many people and activity uh, for those people lead to success? And what's the difference between good and great for accounts? Number two, people specific. Am I calling high enough in the org? Am I multi-threading to, uh, to book the meeting? Am I calling the most effective buyer personas? So typically we have multiple buyer personas, but we prefer one or two. So are they calling into those people uh, as aggressively or more aggressively than the others? And then we have operation specific. So am I calling it the best time for connects and conversion based on data? What are the different postbound initiatives? For instance, content downloads, webinar registrants, event attendees. What are the different outbound scenarios? For more on those, go to the account executive comprehensive messaging guide. I believe it's episode eight. Uh, continuing to push even when you had a strong front end to the month. Ooh, this is a fun one. So every rep who is out there, if you have sold, you have run into where uh, the reality where you've done very well in the first part of the month and you're like, ah, well, I'm at 90% of quota and it's only day three. So like I'm the bomb, I'm going to the beach. <laughs> I think I actually said that to my manager at one point <laughs> when I was first selling. I'm like, I crushed it at the beginning of this month. I'm already at 90%. So like, I'm going to go hang out with my friends and whatever. Like I'm going to lay off the gas. And then around day 21, you're still at 90% because you've been drinking pina coladas with your buddies. And at that point, it's too late to do something about it. So you actually end up not hitting quota. <laughs> so coaching a rep, uh, how not to do that that in sales, it is a numbers game. And whenever you book five meetings in a day, you need to think about those time periods where for two weeks, you didn't get a meeting. So it's all a game of balance. No, nothing. Usually it's a hockey stick syndrome, especially within tech of near the end of the quarter. So how to keep your reps accountable in the times uh, where it feels like they're ahead of the game so that net net you get the result in the end that you need. Um, and then the last one is how to research only once. So those are the four different pieces. So again, for the second 90 days, you had messaging specific, account specific, people specific, and operation specific. And then the last 90 days for SDRs are predicated on the following. Messaging specific, you know, the first, uh, first 90 days we went cold email, second 90 days we went follow up email and break up email. And then the uh, 180 plus, it becomes a game of technique, 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 technique from there on out. So Michael Phelps started swimming at one point. So the first 90 days, he was learning the different strokes. The second 90 days, he was learning, um, I, I don't know, how to hold his breath for a longer period of time or a little bit of technique on how he was taking his arm over. And then the rest of his tenure was inches. So usually the rule of thumb is it's very, very easy to learn a skill, 80% uh, of the skill very, very quickly. And then it becomes a game of you have to bleed more and more and more and more and more to go from 80 to 81, 81 to 82, 90 to 92, 92 to 93, et cetera. So 180 plus for the rest of your tenure in sales, the great news is, is you can always get better. The hard news is, is that you can always get better. So 180 plus, I'm going into things like fluidity, pride aversion. This is where in full blown, you know, algebra or calculus, et cetera. You know, so we already know how to master, we've already mastered cold emailing from a conceptual level. We know how to write a follow-up email at this point. So now we're talking about fluidity, pride aversion, response messages, reading buyer temperament. It's a big one. Can you read the room? Being a human on cold calls, hooking personalization to relevance. Very, very tough to do. If you go to season two, episode one, I go into all uh, of how you can do that from a structure perspective. Avoiding the delegation. Senior leaders are trained to delegate down, you know, so they can save their time. They're master delegators. So how you can avoid that if you know it's the person you want to talk to, how you can pattern interrupt and get through it. At number eight, not cutting your prospect off. 
Uh, number nine, not letting the prospect off the hook when they give you a shallow objection and you hit that um, the crossroads of basically you can either use the pattern interrupt that was taught to you or you can just say like, oh, okay, I'll send you the email. You know, are they letting the prospect off the hook or not? Speed, tone, and ego state. So these are just some examples, but you essentially want to get into the for more finite um, pieces of uh, messaging. And then I also put in the uh, 180 plus, uh, number two, building rapport, how to have no agenda, personalizing, hearing them and adding value, listening. So am I uh, digging, am I asking what I call dig questions where I'm really getting uh, to the root of the objection or the root of what they're actually trying to say? Or am I doing these shallow qualifying questions like how many people do you have on your team that only the answer matters to me in terms of qualifying? Uh, finding the pith. If you go to the cold call session and the core session too, I talk a lot about what I call the pain pith. Before you think I made up a word, pith actually is a word and it means the essence or core of something. Uh, you can Google it if you don't believe me. So the pain pith essentially is we all have uh, three levels or I go into a multitude of going through a pain pulse you know, of understanding the different kinds of questions you can ask and in what order so you can earn the right to ask the next level of question. But essentially, you don't walk up to someone on the street and say, what's your deepest, darkest fear? Or on a first date, you don't say, like, what are your biggest, you know, what are your biggest fears in life, you know, etc. You want to start shallow and then earn the right to go uh, deeper within the conversation over time. So with your prospects, same thing. You don't want to come in and say, you know, what are you scared about when it comes to leadership, you know, in terms of your role, you want to earn the right through research, through asking the right questions. And all of that can come from um, understanding the different tiers of questions to ask. But there usually is a pain pith, meaning there is one thing that someone is scared about. And so they're making a lot of decisions based on that. And they're trying to avoid for and solve that uh, for that piece. And if you do it correctly, it's kind of like a therapist. There is something at the root. And if you are um, an effective salesperson, maybe not on the first call, but throughout, certainly throughout discovery and throughout a long sales tenure, you get to know that sensitive information, that vulnerable information. You treat your prospect with respect and you understand that that is how they are uh, evaluating their decision. So I need to help the person solve for that pain pith. And they're framing everything out, uh, up uh, in regards to that. Uh, number three, not interrupting. Four, uh, learning how to uh, prove that you are listening, not through saying uh-huh, 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 but being able to summarize what they said. Technique specific, so the accountability pitch, classic role diffusion, hard walkout, pattern interrupting, and intention break. For all of these, go into the silver bullet central, but basically all technique items that I'm measuring my reps on in what, days 180 plus for time's sake, I want to uh, just leave you to that. And then number five is uh, future role specific in terms of what to coach on in days 180 plus. A lot of people want to go into an account executive position. That's why they came into SDR as they want to close. So talk about demo negotiation, pricing, closing, discovery and closing. But basically, can I train and can I coach um, my reps in days 180 plus for that next role? So that is a reward for them, you know, delivering on the uh, other pieces. So they're not reaching out for another branch before they've really made a solid footing in this branch. Um, but that is something that I throw in on 180 plus. So that is SDRs. Now let's talk about account executives. Uh, account executives in the first 90 days, I am coaching on the following four items, the who, company, sales process, and role specific. Very, very close to what an SDR is doing, but uh, some key differences. The who is ICC, ICT, who are we selling to? Who is the person within the organization? What kind of accounts? What does the SDR support li look like in marketing support? <clears throat> Number two, company specific. If it's an account executive, they probably kind of done the thing before, right? So it's kind of like whenever I was bartending. I bartended at a lit, uh, you know, number of different uh, bars whenever I was uh, first out of college. So it's kind of like when I came to the second bar and third bar and fourth bar, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, where's the credit card machine? You know, where is the different uh, whatever inventory? Like, who's my bar back? Are they going to get me ice? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Like I was looking for these things and I knew what I was looking for. So an account executive, usually it's the same type of thing. Um, so company specific, uh, they just want to know what the product is, upsell features, deployment, integration partners, and demo instance. 
So usually if you're hiring an AE, a lot of times you're hiring an AE who has done it before. And so you just need to teach them, you know, where the ice is, et cetera, but they know that they should be looking for ice. Number three, sales process specific. So parts of a demo, pricing, POC, red lines, and team selling. What's your expectation in terms of team selling? Outreach has a great uh, uh, principle that it is not uh, irrevocable or unexcusable to lose a deal but it is an egregious offense to lose a deal solo. So they are a big champion. And I love this about their organization of team selling of how do we involve internal stakeholders and how do we leverage all of our resources internally, not only to lead with their best foot forward, um, but to give us the best shot on goal of closing the deal. Uh, number four, role specific. So, you know, very similar, but territory, their quota or bag, what's the data and hygiene uh, uh, expectation within their CRM, activity expectation, uh, components of the sales cycle and leading indicators of the success of those components, what's acceptable evidence that they're doing well. And then number five, what is the expectation for <coughs> self-prospecting? I would say if you are not self-prospecting, I would do it in jest no matter what, because that's what really keeps you sharp and turns you into a seller. So even if I had a great inbound pipe, I would still self-prospect if nothing else to control my fate a little bit more, call my shot and go outbound to really, really high, really lucrative, juicy accounts, but also to keep that prospecting skill sharp because in times like COVID, you know, maybe your outbound funnel dumps out of your purse and you want to ensure that you are in the key, you are in the driver's seat to your own destiny. The second 90 days for uh, what you want to coach on for an account executive are the following. You're going to go really a tier deeper. So the first item is you're going to go company specific selling. So every company typically has some level of methodology, buyer personas, et cetera, ways that they like to do things. And so you really want to visit now that the AE knows where the water cooler is, you know, they know who all the internal stakeholders are and what the product is, et cetera, and what the red lines process looks like. You want to go a tier deeper by saying comp uh, in a company specific way, what are the different buyer uh, personas, competitive positioning, specific features for a specific use case? I hear a lot of engineering, uh, solutions engineering uh, directors say that basically their account executives, especially if it's a technical product, are not pitching the right feature in the right use case. So you want to make sure that you're coaching them of like, hey, we have a broad variety of things that we can sell to this person. And I want to make sure that you know each one of them so that you on your own without me involved can make sure that you are pitching a uh, spoon for ice cream, not a fork for ice cream. Both will work, but the spoon works much better. Uh, inbound trek for buyers, postbound trek for buyers, and outbound trek for buyers. If you are an account executive and watching this and you are running all three of those meetings of you know, this meeting resulted as came in as a result of a demo request versus a content download versus an SDR outbounding versus me self prospecting. They're all very different. And if you're pitching discovery the same, you're uh, in my from my perspective, you're missing out on a low hanging fruit of how you can make the buyer journey and ultimate experience better for your prospect. We do an I do an entire session on this in season two, I believe it's episode 11. If you want to go check that out. So the first piece is company specific in uh, days 90 through 180. And the second is selling specific. So again, you want to go a tier deeper. Um, in the first uh, portion, you're going into really who, the, who's the who and what buyer person are we selling into, what kind of accounts, et cetera. And the second portion in terms of selling methodology, um, you want to uh, drill down to the sales methodology in the second 90 days. Talk about things a little bit more deeply negotiation, asking the right question, listening to the prospect, running the true discovery, digging for, uh, for real pain, the prospect pack that they should be running. But basically you want to take it a tier deeper of now they know who they should be selling into. Now let's talk about our view on how they should be selling into that person so that they have the overall infrastructure. And then in days 180 plus, you're going to go even deeper. So now they know how we think that you should go about that. Let's talk about the finer details of that. So anyone who's been a salesperson knows that it is a long-term game and that you are learning as you go and you are constantly, constantly, constantly learning uh, a lot of times by doing things incorrectly, at least in my experience. 
So uh, coaching in 180 plus, I gave a lot of different examples here of things that I do. A lot of these are going to be um, within Silver Bullet Central if you want to go check them out. Uh, but these are some finer detail granular things. It is the difference between Michael Phelps not making it into the Olympics and Michael Phelps winning the gold and Michael Phelps whenever he won on that relay uh, against the French. Not that we have anything against the French. Absolutely love uh, French uh, people and France in general. But when he did that like this thing, I think you get the analogy <laughs> because they won by milliseconds. How do we get them there? So the prospect pivot, this is a session that's within Silver Bullet Central if you want to go check it out. It'll be released uh, later this year. Uh, hunting accounts holistically. How do I view IBM as IBM and really put the traction and legwork into hunting that count, not just saying I'm going to call one person. And if they don't pick up, then I couldn't get a hold of IBM. Discovering your buyer's pain pith. We mentioned it, but how do they drill down into that? The different sales tracks, how to cause groundswell. That's a really fun one. Uh, pulling down the covers, technique item, but basically, you know, some salespeople, a lot of salespeople, myself included, uh, you know, whenever, whenever a little kid uh, thinks that there's a monster in the room, they pull the covers over their head. It doesn't change the reality of if there's a monster out there, but they, it changes their vision of it. So a lot of salespeople don't ask the tough questions that they need to be asking because they're scared of the response. So how do they pull down the covers in a very polite uh, but direct way, ask the questions that they need to be asking that will just uh, save them some time and their prospects some time. Uh, value selling, building rapport post-sale. This is very important, especially if you are metriced on and driven towards expansion selling. Uh, standing your ground on pricing, saying the pricing and shutting up. <laughs> especially if you came in in a very, very good range and having the confidence and the self-esteem to, um, you know, communicate the pricing and to uh, be quiet. And then number 10, also on pricing, how to not unnecessarily discount pricing. This is a epidemic. Uh, it's a plague in the sales industry of people hiking down pricing uh, right off the bat without provocation, reason, or even a request from their prospects. So how to avoid this in 180 plus. So now we know the outline for all of SDR and AE days 0 through 90, 90 through uh, 180 and 180 plus. Let's talk about two pieces on how to coach remotely, individual and per group, and then I will let you go for the day. How to coach individually. Um, I would say in terms of cold calling, uh, there are several different items that I went into here, but number one, cold calling. I would leverage a cold calling uh, conversation intelligence software like Chorus is who I would recommend. And you can do it by the following, making comments in Chorus ad hoc of like, hey, this was a good call, et cetera. Coaching on industry averages. They have a litany of different averages of like talk times and what will lead to success. So you can coach them against talk times in terms of uh, industry average of what will lead to success. Using the coaching scorecards in Chorus. Uh, Chorus has one-of-a-kind scorecards that are really after uh, making reps successful. So using those, they're a gold mine uh, to really systematize coaching. Number four, coaching against compliance uh, to the seven parts of a cold call. So seven parts of a cold call is the methodology that I use at Flip the Script. To understand what's the best methodology, go to season two, episode 23, where I black out and go into an awesome session that I really loved about how to uncover the best sales methodology. But let's say the seven parts, you know, and flip the scripts is the best. How do I coach against adoption and compliance against that methodology? Because I know it's uh, because I've uncovered from a data perspective that it's the most effective. Number five, coaching on aggregate themes and one-on-ones. And then they bring top of mind um, to the one-on-one -on -one a couple of calls that they want to be coached on. So I pair both. I know I hit on aggregate earlier, but aggregate coaching, you know, you are really saying, okay, what are the common themes here without them in the driver's seat? You also want to enable them by putting them into the driver's seat of saying, hey, response emails in specific, what it bring to that are top of mind for you so I can, you know, help you uh, know how to respond to these different objections. Cold emailing, you can, uh, I basically, for an individual, for a one-on-one, -on -one, I have them, I go through all of these different items in an email for their one-on-one. -on -one. 
So I not only look at their aggregate uh, emails, but I also have them bring one to me for response emails. But for the aggregate emails, these are the things that I'm looking for to see what are the common low hanging fruit of where I can coach them in aggregate to get better. Subject lines, the premises that they picked, was it a really good personalization uh, reason that we can hook to our value prop? Did they personalize? Uh, did they, to that person in specific, were they relevant in terms of buyer persona, industry vertical or firmographic criteria, et cetera? Did they hook that? All three are needed. Personalization plus relevance. Did you hook it together? Seven pillars of attractive messaging and seven deadly sins that they should stay away from. For more, go into the cold emailing uh, core session. But essentially, I am wondering for my individual or for the individuals on a coaching level, for the cold emailing, these are the things that I'm looking for in terms of aggregate coaching so I can help them to get better. So again, in coaching, it comes down to how egregious is the offense in terms of what they're doing and how frequent is it happening in terms of how I'm ranking to uh, prioritize what to coach against. Um, and cold calling, you can do the, uh, the following through tech. Activity specific. Calling minimums, emailing minimums, different bars for personalization versus relevance. For instance, I had a email uh, minimum of 35 if people were truly personalizing every email because that would lead uh, them to success. Uh, but if they just wanted to pick relevance only, and I would consider relevance buyer persona specific or industry vertical specific, a lot of the different uh, variables that most people would call in the industry personalized, but isn't to the person. Difference between personalization and relevance is personalization is to an individual only that you cannot replicate to other users. And relevance is you can segment to several different users. So I had different bars. I said, if you're going to be personalized and you're going to hook it, 35 is your metric per day. If you're going to be relevant only, then 135 is your metric. So you tell me which one you want. Um, amount, and this isn't to be mean. This is because I know that that's what will net out in the results that they want. Amount of prospects that they've added. So basically, I'm looking at their, their activity and coaching against it um, in terms of an individual basis, motivational basis. I'm coaching on, are there any blockers in their day? Anything that's holding them back? Is there uh, a personal progression or a skill set? But basically, are they motivated during this time? So in the first round, it's really messaging specific. Are they there in terms of coaching for uh, the technique that they're using and skill that they're using? Whereas the latter, it's more so the and then, the et cetera. So sometimes people will come to a one-on-one -on -one and I'll be like, how's it going? And they'll, you know, burst into tears. <laughs> of like, oh, this is what's going on in my, you know, this is what's happened in my life, or I just got hung up by a prospect, or, you know, I feel like I'm running into this other thing. So this is more finite messaging specific. This is more holistic to the rep of how do I view them as a person. Uh, the last one is operations. So level of productivity, challenges, roadblocks, uh, things to focus on in the upcoming weeks, back end logistics of, you know, maybe they don't know how to hunt accounts holistically, or <clears throat> excuse me, they got locked out of some piece of tech, et cetera, you know, and you need to help them understand Salesforce to pull reports, et cetera. How can I coach them to get better in that perspective to um, unleash the, the potential that they have and really remove roadblocks for them? And then a balance, coaching them on a balance of non-revenue generating activities and revenue generating activities. So you want to coach them of, yes, these internal meetings are really fun, you know, with my AE and SDR, but I need to be prioritizing the rev generating activities because that's the thing that is really going to add the gas. So an account executive, you don't have to say this twice to, uh, part of the reason they don't want to update their hygiene and or uh, keep their CRM hygiene clean is it takes time and it doesn't make them money. But SDRs, you really need to coach this, uh, coach this through with them. Great way to do this. Certainly not to product pitch. The ambition team is absolutely amazing at help at leveraging to coach remotely, especially for things like activity and roadblocks and challenges and how many prospects are they adding. Very, very good platform, very, very great team. So again, I've mentioned Mark McWaters out of sincerity of my own heart. If you want to learn how to leverage them to coach remotely, um, you can reach out to Mark and mention the video. You don't have to mention the video if you don't want. I certainly, you know, I don't get any attribution on the back end, but point being the, the tech is amazing. So I would reach out to the ambition team if you do have the budget and you're saying like, I want to take coaching very seriously. Here's a couple of screenshots. You can see if you have the deck in front of you that uh, they can measure, uh, measure calls, emails, new contacts, new leads, and talk time. 
And they can even send you reports on, uh, you know, not only like this is the activity metric, but these are the top, you know, these are the reps, unfortunately, that didn't hit the activity metric for the week so that you know who to focus on and who are, um, you know, uh, consistent offenders. And then here's a screenshot over here um, on the other side talking about it's really about systematizing coaching. <laughs> it's really about making it trackable consistent so that you can make sure that you are uh, really putting your best foot forward and effort to make sure the rep gets better over time. So this is a way, you know, I know a lot of people do it in Google Sheets. It's just really hard to track that way and to lead to, uh, okay, what are the leading indicators over time that I need to be focusing on? So um, ambition is a good way to do it. Here's a couple of screenshots and product, but uh, you get the, uh, you get the pitch, the dog and pony show. So let's talk about how to coach remotely, a group remotely, and then we will close out. How to coach a group remotely. So I uh, did over call and over email. Over email, I do a weekly email review and I structure the email review in the following. There's four different pieces to it. Number one, I pick a first email. And what I mean by first email is the uh, first email in the sequence. I pick each email for uh, me, especially if you're using my sequences in Reggie, each one of them are different uh, in terms of structure, in terms of the goal, et cetera. So I pick a first email up for the rep. So this actually increased accountability that they're like, crap, if I send an email that's not that great, then I, uh, I could be on blast in front of everyone. So I would, I would actually take videos of me scanning through and just uh, ad hoc picking one so they didn't think I was being mean uh, or that I was you know, being choosy to prove a point. But sometimes I would do that just to be like, hey guys, I am here to just pick one so we can coach to get better. I pick a first email and I would, me I would measure them against... Um, Seven pillars of attractive messaging. How well did they hit them? What was their ranking and why? Seven deadly sins. Did they do stuff that they shouldn't? The quality of the premise that they picked. Hopefully it's in bucket one, two, or three. The quality of the hook. Did they hook personalization to relevance and how well did they do that? And three th things uh, that they did uh, well and three things that they need to work on. I think I just said the word thung. <laughs> That's a new one. But essentially I would bring this to deck of like, I'm going to pick one email from the group. You know, I'm going to scan through an aggregate, pick one, and I'm going to measure them against these things. Uh, quick tip here is I would start with saying, before I go into this, you know, let's say it's John's email. I would say, Mike, what do you think of this email? And the great thing, the stunning thing is over time, they would come up with the things that I was thinking before I would go into them. So it brings another level of validation, but it really empowers them of like, oh, they just got the right answer and they're hearing it from their peers. So that's kind of a quick tip that enriched the sessions for me. But I pick a first email. Uh, the second piece is I always pick a fourth email. So a little different flavor, go into follow-up emails, the session in the core session, core session five, uh, to hear more about that. But I would pick a fourth email in the sequence, which uh, and I would measure them against the same thing. Seven pillars, deadly sins, quality of premise, quality of hook, three things they did well and three things they struggle uh, that I think that they need to do better. And I would start with asking another rep on the team, calling them out in name specific. What do you think about this email so that they can uh, kind of lay the groundwork there? The third piece is I would pick a response email. I would say you need to prep response emails by putting them in a Google sheet beforehand. Um, and having accountability there of like, you need to pick, pick some level of response email that you need help on. And I would ask them the following questions. Number one, what is the temperament of the prospect? Number two, what's the level of detail to the objection? And based on those two and a few other criterion, number three, was it real? Because if it's real, you need to say, I understand, try to mean it and walk away. And then number four, if you don't think it was real and it was a shallow objection, it was, I need to wash my hair, <laughs> then how do you counter it? So that was the third piece I did in group email review. And then the last piece uh, is I would pick uh, several different hooks. So I would say, okay, you need to bring to, I will prep emails uh, one and four, these first two pieces. And your uh, accountability in this situation is I would have two Google Sheets to say before every coaching session, and I would set a calendar reminder before the day beforehand of, hey, response emails are due. So people would influx, you know, two response emails they wanted help on, and I would pick from the group. 
And then I also had a separate sheet for uh, how to hook personalization to relevance and say you need to fill them in here. And I'd send them a calendar in invite for the day before so that they go, oh, okay, I need to put in several hooks. So you'd be very intentional about coaching. Coaching is difficult. I mean, it's like anything that's good in life. It is difficult. It takes a lot. So any great relationship, you have to work at it. So I would give them calendar reminders and then I would put this plan together, but we would follow this structure every single week. And then for calls, and then I will close out, um, I would do for remotely, especially within a group, uh, I would run a call review. How you can do this as a conversation intelligence platform, but I essentially would review calls for other people to um, hear and give their thoughts on. And then I would give them my feedback, much similar to the email review, where I'd be reviewing per, uh, how personalized was, was the pitch, how relevant was the pitch, uh, how was the elevator pitch? Was it relevant to that buyer persona? Uh, and can we, um, can we make that better? Were you human on the call? How did you handle objections? Were you listening really well? Were you reading the room? And were you asking the right questions? So in summary, uh, COVID has impacted our coaching. Um, but I think that it may have, uh, if we do it correctly, impacted it for the better. So there is a silver lining here that we can change our coaching atmosphere to be very data-driven, very intentional about coaching, very consistent about coaching, and coach in aggregate so that we can make sure that we make the biggest impact for our reps um, you know, possible during uh, a bad situation like COVID. So I know that there was, there was a lot of different pieces to that leading up to that. And it's going to start at day zero and or day one, and it's going to go through the rest of their tenure in sales. But the fun thing about that is there's always the opportunity that you can get better. So that is everything. That is a wrap for the season. Thanks so much, everybody, for watching. If you like this season and session and want to hear more, we will have season three coming out in 2021, or you can check out all the different sessions on flipthescript.co with other sales topics just like it. And if you really love this session, do me a favor, go to LinkedIn, tag Flip the Script, me, and give me a follow and tell me your top two takeaways so I know what you want to hear more of so I can double down on that in season three. But other than that, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah.